Space is a very precious commodity here in my office. And over the last couple of months, I've been testing a variety of alternative input devices to help shrink the real estate of my keyboard and mouse, both here on my shooting desk, as well as on my workbench. Have I been successful? Let's find out. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Like I mentioned in the intro, space is not something I have a lot of here in my office, which is why I'm attempting to build a new one, which, by the way, I should have an update on that project here very shortly. But in the meantime, I still need to be able to work on all the various PCs and servers that I build here in my office. Now, that means I need a couple of things. I need a monitor, I need a keyboard, I need a mouse, and I need network connection. Now, a lot of those are very easily solved. For example, you've seen me get away from using a monitor here on my desk, instead I use a capture card over here on my main PC. You've seen me get away from having to string network cables across the room because I have a switch right here under my desk, so I have a couple of you know two and three foot patch cables, and that seems to work just fine. But there's not a lot of getting around the need for a keyboard and a mouse and the space required to actually use them. Now my go-to setup for this has been this Velocifier 10 keyless keyboard and my trusty Logitech G602 wireless mouse. And for the most part, they are fairly compact and very easy to use and very comfortable. And I love the feel of this Velocifier keyboard. But they still do require some real estate even when using them and especially when storing them. The mouse does have the wireless dongle stored right here under the battery compartment and the batteries on this do seem to last for freaking ever. I think I've had this mouse for five years and maybe changed the batteries twice. This Velocifier keyboard in a 10 keyless form factor, nice and compact and wired USB. So I typically just wrap the cable up and set the keyboard aside. So how do you reduce the amount of space that you need to use a keyboard and a mouse? Well, there's a couple of ways to go about it. One, you could combine them into a single unit. That way you don't need to travel outside of the real estate of that unit. The other thing you could do is go with a trackball, which I'm obviously very fond of in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, that way, again, you're not combining the units, but you don't have to travel out, you don't need more real estate than the object itself takes up to use. And so I'm gonna try both methods. I've been trying both these methods for the last, I don't know, three, four, five weeks or so. Uh, which devices have I been successful with? Which haven't I been successful with? And what are my thoughts overall? As I'm getting everything set up here, I will say some of these devices were sent out by their respective manufacturers. Some of them were purchased. Some of them were a little of both. Uh, this ProtoArc keyboard that I'm going to start with, I purchased this, but they did send over a couple of the trackballs. I've worked with Elecom before and they've sent me a couple different trackballs before. Uh, I purchased this one myself as well. And then both these other keyboards I bought off Amazon. So. I'm gonna judge them all 100% equally as I always do. And if it wasn't obvious, no money changed hands. So I think we'll start out with the mouse and keyboard combination units. And we'll start with the one that I bought first. And this is from RII, R-I-I. It is the Real Internet Idea Keyboard and Trackpad Combo. Uh, this one caught my eye for a couple different reasons. Number one, it can be connected both via a very short USB cable or via an RF dongle that also stores in the little area under here. Uh, it is a wireless keyboard or wired keyboard and it is rechargeable and it has a built-in lithium ion battery which you charge by plugging it in right here. Now the thing that attracted me to the Re keyboard and trackpad combo is it's literally the exact same or slightly larger form factor as far as overall real estate than the Velocifier 10 keyless keyboard that I was already using day to day. Now obviously I'm going to give up quality in the keyboard for a smaller size, but that was a sacrifice I was willing to make as this isn't a daily driver. This was a, I needed to use it for 20 minutes at a time style keyboard. Um, that being said, I'm still fairly disappointed in it. 
Now, because this is essentially the same 10 keyless keyboard crammed into 80% of the space, the keys are about 90 to 93% of the size they would be on a standard keyboard. That means you're getting Chromebook or even worse levels of key spacing. Now, that's not the worst thing in the world, but the keyboard itself is also of Chromebook or even worse keyboard quality. It's not that it's unusable or untypable as it were, it's just, it's a terrible feeling keyboard. Uh, the, the keys are very mushy. They're not consistent from one key to the other either. Some of them have a very sharp actuation point. Others just kind of press in and you get no tactile feedback at all. Uh, this is a laptop scissor mechanism with a button dome. Uh, so very similar to you know, a gamepad or something like that uh, on the key presses. Uh, the J key, there's almost no bump at all. The E key, by contrast, has a very sharp snap when it actually actuates. Um, but going one key to the next, you're not actually sure if you're used to any kind of tactile feedback if you pressed a key or not. And because it changes one key to the other, you're constantly questioning if you actually <laughs> typed in the thing you meant to type. So as a typist that is fairly heavy handed, I do like a tactile bump and I like very heavy keys. And unfortunately that's something you usually have to pay extra for. This just isn't doing it for me. That said, it's a perfectly usable keyboard. Now, like a lot of inexpensive keyboards, this one suffers from a bit of 90s-ism. And what I mean by that is there are hot keys for everything that you're never gonna use in this day and age. Uh, there is a function button to launch a clock, to launch your email program, to take you to your homepage. There's a search, there's exchange, there's calculator. Uh, and then there's a lock button, which I haven't figured out what it does because there's no numpad on here. So is that a num lock? Is that a scroll lock? I don't know. Now, while the keyboard is fine, I can't say the same about the trackpad. The trackpad is fairly large. That's one thing we look for in a lot of modern laptops. Get away from that, you know, Dell tiny little trackpad and get to something that actually has some real estate to it. Um, this one is vertically oriented, which is nice for space savings. But I'm kind of wondering if they literally took the trackpad input acceleration and flipped it sideways. What I mean by that is it seems to accelerate faster vertically than it does horizontally, which makes it really difficult to keep track of your cursor on the screen and makes it almost impossible to pinpoint exactly what you're trying to point at on the screen. While the cursor really doesn't move when you don't want it to, if I place my finger down, it, it does stay in place, but the movements are so randomly accelerated. Uh, it's really difficult to, to pinpoint something to point at. Overall, not terrible. Uh, if, if I had to use this for basic input and basic testing, it would certainly work. But it's, it's not something I would want to daily drive. It, it is frustrating trying to point to something accurately with the trackpad, click on it, which it's not an active trackpad. There's no button underneath it. So instead you get these little zones right here that are touch sensitive. The multi-touch on here was awful as well. Good thing there's a dedicated scroll section on this trackpad as well. It's decently well built. It's, it's not crazy thin plastic. It's not the best feeling thing in the world, but for $30 for a secondary input for a test bench, it'd probably work. But don't daily drive this. This is, the consistency is what kills it for me. It's difficult to know exactly where you're going to point the trackpad at, and it's difficult to know if you've pressed the right button. Six out of 10, not terrible. Next up, I don't even know who made this one, but I found it on Amazon and it looked interesting because I am very much a trackball fan, as I find they tend to be a little bit more foolproof than trackpads when it comes to integrated devices. And uh, this one has the added benefit of almost holding it like a game controller if you wanted, so you can use the trackball 
with your thumb right here, and then you've got mouse buttons as shoulder buttons. Kind of a unique form factor, and I kind of liked it. But this is my worst purchase in this batch. For starters, the keyboard is about the same 90 to 93% size that it is on the previous one. And while it is a little bit more consistent, the keys themselves seem to be just a little bit tighter. There's not as much space in between the keys. And so this keyboard, more than the Re, I found myself hitting two keys instead of just one. Uh, and I, I couldn't adjust myself out of that. So trying to type in terminal commands in Linux, not a great option. As far as connectivity options go, unlike the Re, this is an RF keyboard only. There's no Bluetooth, there's no USB connection. Uh, also, instead of a lithium ion battery pack, this one uses a couple of double A's. That can be a plus or a minus depending on your point of view. I kind of like the idea of being able to recharge batteries and be able to swap them in and out as needed. These are AA rechargeables that I added to this. Uh, some people just want to plug in a USB cable and charge the keyboard. I get both standpoints. Uh, they both have their pros and cons. But coming down to the usability of this one, um, man, the trackball is just garbage uh, because it's not an optical trackball. Uh, it seems to be a rollerball driven mouse. And once you go optical on mice, which we did around 1998, you don't go back to rollerball technology. Not only is this a rollerball driven uh, trackball, it's incredibly tiny, which doesn't help with accuracy. Uh, number two, the trackball doesn't seem to be removable to be able to clean the darn thing. Uh, this top section doesn't remove from the keyboard. So if I ever gummed up the the uh, potentiometers, the rollers inside of there, there's no coming back from that. This keyboard has a number of layout issues as well. Uh, for example, the arrow keys are incredibly and laughably small, at least on the Re, they were somewhat usable. These ones are half size, even by the laughably small standards of this. Um, there is a delete key, but there's also a function button for control alt delete if you wanted to two finger salute instead of three finger salute. So I guess that's a thing. Much like the re keyboard, this one also includes a bunch of the hotkeys that only your grandparents ever use. So there's a home button, back, forward, stop, refresh page, search, and dedicated open exchange key. Uh, so there's all that. There are some media keys along the side, volume buttons, as well as track, play, stop, etc. Everything on this, while it worked, it was just a total letdown. Uh, everything about this was frustrating to use, was inaccurate, uh, and overall just clumsy execution. Uh, this one, three out of 10. It plugged in and it did what it said, but it really sucked at doing it. There you go. Moving on to the ProtoArc keyboard. Now this one is super interesting because I can store it in a very small space. I could build a little drawer to save this and keep it under my desk. Uh, I could just set it up on top of a desktop and it would work, but it folds out into the same form factor as that Re keyboard where you have the full 10 keyless layout plus your vertically oriented trackpad. Uh, this one, I had extremely high hopes for. Now this one is also the most expensive one on the list. I think the first two were 25 and $30. And then this one tops the charts at $49. But given its foldability and ProtoArc being a fairly reputable brand, again, I had some pretty high expectations for this one. But getting right into it, how does it work? Uh, this is a 100% sized keyboard in almost every aspect, but a 65% layout. That means it is 10 keyless. Uh, the bulk of the keyboard is 100% sized keys. So you, all of your QWERTY, uh, tab, shift, control, alt, etc. But speaking strictly to usability, uh, my first complaint comes in the fact that when the keyboard is unfolded like this, the ends of the keyboard are loose enough where they will flex backwards. 
and there's no bump stops on the edge to keep the keyboard from falling off just that little bit. So this spring holds everything level. But then when you press it, this part of the keyboard flexes this way and then touches the desk because there's nothing holding it up to keep it level other than spring tension. The center of the keyboard feels wonderful. You're, you're you know, 65 to 70% of your keyboard layout, most of your right hand feels wonderful. The left hand, every time I go to hit a, a key, the keyboard falls about an eighth of an inch. And it's maddeningly frustrating. <laughs> So what that means is much like the re keyboard, your tactile feedback of did you press a button and did you do it well, as well as your audible feedback changes depending on which button you press. And so if I press the L key, it sounds very much like a laptop. Again, this is a scissor mechanism with a rubber dome on it. If I press the A key, the whole keyboard shifts and slams into the desk. So whether or not the keys themselves actuate at the same rate and at the same pressure, everything changes about it. And so your left hand is constantly questioning if you just did that motion right, if you're a touch typist like I am. Keeping with the usability theme, uh, the letter keys are very well laid out. They're 100% size, like I mentioned earlier, making it very easy to transition from a full-size keyboard onto this without skipping a beat or bypassing your muscle memory in some way. Uh, there are a couple odd decisions on here, though, that make it difficult to use as a tech bench or even as a daily driver. Uh, your delete key is an alt key on the backspace, which is also a half size key. So if you needed to do control alt delete, it's no longer control alt delete, it's control alt function delete. It takes a little bit of remembering and training that I otherwise wouldn't like to do. So instead of a three finger salute, it's a four finger salute. You have to go control function alt and then delete. Probably not the biggest thing in the world if this was just a one off keyboard using on a tech bench, but as any kind of a daily driver solution, not a fan of this. Gone are your grandparents' shortcuts and enter the modern media and actual system shortcuts. So you have brightness up and down, you have uh, your media keys, volume buttons, etc. That's all very well laid out right here on the top number row. Again, speaking to usability, we come to connectivity. And this is where I have a major issue with this keyboard. Even though there's a USB-C port on here, which does charge the internal lithium ion battery, and you will get somewhere around 20 hours of use off a single charge, this keyboard is Bluetooth only. That's right, you cannot use this wired. They didn't bother including HID connectivity on that USB-C port. And to me, that immediately disqualifies this as being able to use as a general purpose keyboard. I need to be able to plug this in and access the BIOS of a system without installing an operating system and pairing it to the onboard Bluetooth if the system I'm using even has Bluetooth. I love the form factor. I could get over some of the usability concerns, but is that a kickstand? Son of a... Okay. I'm about to take back what I said for the entire left hand not working well. Um, there's a freaking kickstand built into this. <laughs> How I didn't notice that before, I have no idea, but there it is. Um, yeah, no, it totally stays flat now. Yeah, um, okay, typing ability, 10 out of 10 now. 100% uh, layout, easy to get used to. Maybe nine out of 10, because there's still the control alt delete thing that I have a problem with, but uh, at least the keyboard stays level. Uh, but connectivity, if I can't plug this into a system pre-boot and have it work as a keyboard, it's really of no use to me. Now I know this is supposed to be used as a keyboard for a tablet or a smartphone. It comes with this nice, you know, faux leather case with a magnetic clasp, and it even comes with a tablet sm slash smartphone stand. So you can stand up a device that you want to use with the keyboard and, uh, and boom, Bob's your uncle as far as a mobile layout goes. 
The problem is, that's not how I wanted to use it. So it feels disingenuous for me to give this a negative review because this is aimed more at a smartphone tablet style interface. If you didn't want to use a Surface keyboard and instead wanted to keep this in your bag with your Surface tablet or your iPad. But how difficult is it to add USB connectivity to this? Uh, so I will say form factor, 10 out of 10. Usability, nine out of 10. Connectivity, four out of 10. Because you have to have an operating system to be able to pair this with Bluetooth to be able to use it. You can't just plug in a USB RF adapter or just plug in a USB-C cable and have it work. I wanna like this keyboard, I really do, but it's just not gonna work for me. I wish this had an HID option. If it did, nine out of 10, $50, great keyboard. So with the keyboards out of the way, let's go ahead and talk mice because that is one major area where you can actually save a lot of space even though it doesn't seem like it. Now again, I typically use my Velocifier 10 keyless keyboard and I love the feel of this keyboard. I love the space of this keyboard. However, if I have to use a mouse, I have to constantly do this number. If I can have something that is stationary, that is easy to store and then not have to move my hand, that's actually a huge bonus in my life. So that is gonna be my criteria with these three. And trust me, these three are about as unique as you will ever see as far as mice go. So in front of me are three different options for trackballs. Uh, this is the ProtoArc EM01. Uh, it is a thumb-driven trackball, which I'm not a huge thumb-driven fan. My thumb is fairly short. Uh, I much prefer a finger-driven trackball, which I usually drive with my entire wrist. It's just a little bit more comfortable for me, but that's an ergonomic thing, not a everyone should use finger-driven trackballs. Uh, it is a very precise optical trackball. It's a one and a quarter inch ball, if I remember correctly. Uh, and overall, fairly comfortable. Now this does work in two physical modes. Uh, you can lay it flat like this where your hand is kind of leaning what feels slightly towards the left or you can click the base over and do it a little bit more vertically. And that's actually the way I prefer to use this trackball. It feels a little bit more natural, keeps your, your arm nice in line there. And if you're using this in conjunction with a keyboard, it's very easy to just reach over grab the trackball, do what you need, move back to the keyboard. So overall, I really do like the EM01. It supports multiple grip styles, either horizontal or slightly vertical. Um, it's got a very nice feeling scroll wheel. That's actually probably my favorite feature of this is that scroll wheel right under your middle finger. But I have some usability issues with this mouse, which we'll also get to on the next trackball as well and that is the buttons and their layout. Modern mice are expected to have a number of different things. There's your left click, your right click, your scroll, your scroll button, that is the press on your middle button uh, or your scroll wheel, as well as typically forward and back keys for your web browser. While the EM01 has forward and back keys, ProtoArc has opted to keep your thumb on the ball and move the forward and back keys to finger press buttons right off of your left click. They're very small buttons. And I'm sure after a while of using this mouse, you could get that, that muscle memory required for it. I mean, Lord knows I know a lot about developing muscle memory for particular input devices. Um, for me, I just don't like these ones. If you haven't gathered by now, very much like a keyboard, I tend to be fairly heavy-handed, heavy-fingered. I don't know if that comes from 20 years of guitar and clarinet and saxophone, or if that comes from just my input style. Um, the buttons on this are all entirely too mushy for me, especially the left and right click. I get what they were going for. They were going for a very silent input device. They wanted this to be as non-obtrusive, as little exclamation as possible when actually performing an input. Um, and the mouse is basically silent uh, with just the slightest amount of tactile feedback when you do press either left or right click. I wanna hear it, I wanna feel it, I wanna experience it. And, and, and that all tells my brain you successfully initiated an input, congratulations. On this one, I don't 
feel as though I actually clicked the left button. It leaves me questioning whether or not that input actually went through. Same with the right click, although the right click feels slightly different than the left click, which I do also have a problem with. Uh, the scroll wheel button, very tactile, very firm, very on, off. You know that you clicked that button. The forward and back buttons, kind of somewhere in between. It, it takes a little bit of force to actually actuate them. You can hear the click on them a little bit louder than the left and the right, but they're also mushy in their feedback. I, I can't feel that tactile bump. Mice are an entirely subjective thing to review. And so all I can give you is my preferences on what I like in mice and what I like on different buttons and inputs and feel and, and response and everything else. Um, this one, even though I'm not a fan of the thumb trackball uh, orientation, this was very precise, very easy to learn. I've used thumb trackballs a number of times in my life. Um, and the scroll wheel is superb. However, the rest of the mouse found me kind of waffling in my input. I, it wasn't precise enough for me to give this a full recommendation. I'm sure someone really likes that silent click. They don't want to annoy their neighbor. They also don't use mechanical keyboards in their cubicle, which I totally understand as well. Uh, this might be the perfect solution if you're looking for a silent and ergonomic uh, thumb trackball. If you're looking for something with a little bit more tactile feedback and a little bit more precision in the button presses, probably not for you. But EM01, not a bad option. That said, I do have one major complaint when it comes to the ProtoArc EM01 as far as connectivity goes. Now, this is a three mode input device. That is, it will work over USB-C, it will work over Bluetooth LE, or it will work over RF with the included RF dongle. My complaint comes in that there is nowhere to store the RF dongle even though there is likely ample room inside of this device. The RF dongle just kind of lives, which means you're going to lose it. Moving on to the ProtoArc EM03 and a mouse that's a little bit more my style with the finger trackball. It's a slightly larger trackball at a, it's either one and three quarter or two inch. I don't remember exactly which. Uh, but much like the EM01 is incredibly smooth, a little bit of that graphite glitter finish uh, and an optically sensed trackball. Now, the majority of my EM01 review is going to apply to the EM03. They share a lot of the same DNA. Uh, this one is a little bit more of a flat and then your hand arcs around the mouse. So my wrist is flat up until the point that it meets the mouse and then there's a slight rotation in the top of my hand going up. So again, you have to base your exact preferences based on the way your wrist likes to sit. I don't like it, it tweaks ever so slightly to the right. Uh, whereas the EM01 rotated my entire wrist, this one requires my arm to be flat and then rotates further up on my wrist. Uh, so there's that. A lot like the EM01, I am pretty hot and cold on the buttons and the mix of different tactile feedbacks uh, of those buttons on the EM03. There's a left click button right here under your thumb. There's a right click here under your ring finger. There's a scroll wheel, which has a center click, but again, no horizontal scroll. There's also a forward and back button here, which your thumb is also responsible for. So you get left click, scroll, center click, and forward and back all on your thumb right here. As far as usability, the left and the right click are very much in the same camp of the EM01. They are the silent click from ProtoArc, which I just don't like. There's very little tactile feedback. They are dead silent, but because there's no feedback, it leaves me questioning if I actually clicked on something. The scroll wheel is definitely a little bit different design. It's a little bit smoother scroll with less firm ratcheting on that. My other problem with that is I tend to, when I'm using this mouse, uh, press the center click when I'm trying to scroll. Your thumb is one of the strongest muscles as per mass in your body. Um, and while I'm trying to scroll, it's not uncommon for me to click the center button of this mouse. Uh, it's a very light touch is all that's required on this one. And because the, the ratcheting is kind of imprecise and not very tactile and not very firm as well, 
it kind of adds to that overall problem. And again, there are forward and back buttons on here, but I don't like the placement. I would like both of them to be further forward on the mouse. Uh, my thumb, when it comes up, it is on the front leading edge of the forward button. To get to the back button, I actually have to rotate my entire hand back and, and pull my thumb in tight to be able to hit the leading edge of the back button. Um, it leads to me shifting my grip entirely, which is the exact opposite thing you want to do when you're using a trackball. It's the whole thing that the trackball is trying to prevent you from doing is having to shift your grip to press a particular button. But again, mice are very subjective things, uh, as are all input devices. Uh, this one didn't really jive with me, even though it is my preferred uh, ball style finger input device. Um, just the button layout didn't jive with my hand size, with my ergonomics, with the way I like to do things. I think regardless of your hand style, those forward and back buttons need to move further forward on the mouse to be a little bit more accessible on the front edge of your thumbs movement rather than trying to push towards the back edge of your thumbs input dexterity. So after taking a look at both of these, it comes down to would I recommend either of these? I think I would recommend the EM01. It's a $49 trackball. It is very well built. I love the dual ergonomic position of it. So whether you want your wrist slightly vertical or completely horizontal, it supports both of those. And despite me not preferring the silent clicks, um, that is something that is going to be very subjective. And if you like that silent click and if you're after that, I think this is going to be a solid mouse that you can learn how to use. And I have another issue with the EM03, and that is the overall texture of this mouse. It is very slick, and it is reminiscent of some of the rubberized plastics that tend to start peeling after six months of use, where either the oils on your hands or just the wearing of the plastic itself will start to eat away at this top coating. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but I've seen it happen on so many devices that feel like this, that I feel after a while, this, this top coating of this entire mouse is likely to gum up and uh, stop feeling so pleasant. Also, just the thumb ergonomics on this, it's, it's too far back even for someone with very short thumbs. Uh, I would like to see not only the forward back button, but everything moved forward. Uh, this one is only $40, $39.99. For a finger trackball, I really like this size, this finger trackball setup, but the rest of this mouse, I think needs some tweaks before it gets my full recommendation. And now on to the weirdest of the bunch, one that I bought just because I wanted to try it out. Um, I've tried similar form factors in the past, and that is the Elecom Realcon. It is a thumb-driven trackball. It is a three-quarter inch trackball that is a handheld pistol grip. Uh, this is how you're supposed to use this mouse. Um, and I have to say, for $50, I'm not impressed. I will say, for as much as I typically like Elecom mice, uh, this one has a couple of things going for it that are keeping me from recommending it. Namely, in the trackball itself. The trackball doesn't fit securely and snugly inside of this housing. It tends to want to bounce left or right or forward and back as you're using it. And so you'll touch it and you'll feel the ball shift into a position, like a false set when you're picking a lock. Uh, it, it'll shift ever so slightly. And your initial input, it just doesn't feel great when you're doing that. Uh, your left click is here on the bottom trigger. Your right click is on top. And they are two wildly different buttons as far as feel. They might be the same button internally as far as the same momentary press switch. But just because of their placement, the right click has almost no feedback at all. And the left click feels plasticky and unprecise. And in fact, the whole key wants to move forward and down and it ends up feeling very spongy and unprecise. There are forward and back buttons on this mouse and they are here driven by the thumb on either side of the scroll wheel. Uh, the scroll wheel, 
very, very nice feeling. Again, it's a very firm, ratcheted design with a very solid and tactile center click. I really like the scroll wheel on this mouse. This also has a media key, hot key thing on it. And I'm sure they were trying to go for the, the PowerPoint presenter uh, thing, but this whole thumb arrangement is just very awkward to use because the whole design of this mouse is so your thumb will sit on the trackball. You have to bring it down more than a halfway through the mouse. So you're 55% of your way to the bottom before you can get to the media keys. Uh, for which there's volume up, down, track, uh, previous and forward, and then a play pause button or okay button in the center. It's just not, not the greatest feel. And, and holding onto the mouse when you're trying to use this, it's kind of an exercise in futility. You're gonna drop this. Now in all of the promotional material, it does come with this little cradle, which you can set it on on your desk. And when I see a cradle in modern products, I assume charging and connectivity. I assume a USB cord going out to the computer to handle RF or something else, and then this will also charge the device. However, that could not be further from the truth. This is literally just a plastic stand made out of the same material. Uh, this mouse is entirely Bluetooth driven and uses a pair of AAA batteries. I'm sure there's a use case for this. I'm sure some people will eat this up, but if you're looking for Elecom trackball quality, this one feels a solid step removed from the quality I would get on a huge or a Deft Pro or something like that. The, the ball itself is where the quality starts and stops. And this one, it likes to rattle around in there. And it, it's just not nearly as precise as some of their other trackballs. So these are some of the alternative input devices that I have been taking a look at over the last month or two trying to solve a couple of issues that I have here in my own office, but also I'm always interested in new and unique input devices or evolutions of old ones. Obviously, trackballs have been around forever, even arguably longer than mice, and it's always fun to see some new and unique form factors. There's definitely a lot of good here. There's also some things that I'm not so happy with, and some of the devices like the, the Re and the unnamed trackball combo, they're, they're very cheaply made. But then we have other items from well-known brands like ProtoArc and Elecom that are also kind of misses in this regard. Um, so I'm not sure where to leave this one. This was more just a, a little bit of a show and tell of things that I've been testing in the, the background and behind the scenes in videos, but also just kind of experimenting on my own because this is the kind of thing that I would do whether I had a YouTube channel or not. Hopefully you learned something about some of these devices or maybe you found a device that you wanted to take a further look at. If you are interested in looking at any of these, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Like always, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's gonna do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Parallel 45 Brewing in Independence, Oregon. It is the Electric Dream Machine IPA, clocking in at 7%. It's always a good sign when you can smell the hops at arm's length. So one thing I really like, the head on this beer, it's not going anywhere. Now in part because of my nucleated pint glass, craftcomputing.store, but it is very, very dense and thick and incredibly uniform. I mean, look how thick that is. That's insane. Oh wow, and very, very sweet. Whoa. So the beer itself is very traditional West Coast IPA. It's very dry, little citrus, little grass, little bit of, of some hop dankness on the back end. Very solid.
flavor profile. But the head on this is super sweet. Like buttercream frosting out of a cake, but slightly hop flavored. It's the weirdest thing. I seriously want a cake with that flavor in it now. Like that's, <laughs> it's a really good IPA with one of the most unique flavors that I've ever sussed out of one before. West Coast IPA and white cake. I like it. 